The question becomes, how did this happen? Why did it happen? What exactly meteorologically went down in Texas near the Guadalupe in Kirk County in the Hill Country? Uh, and to, to get that answer, I need a meteorologist. It's going to be Chris Martz. He's at cfact.org, and he's a meteorologist. Chris, how are you? Good to see you. Good about you. I'm doing very well. We're in, in uh, north of San Antonio, south of where the rain hit. We're not far from the Guadalupe River, but we, we weren't in peril at all. About an hour north of us is where all this stuff went down. Can you tell me, meteorologically speaking, what the hell went on on Friday night? Or was it Friday night or was it was actually Thursday night, Friday morning? Thursday night into Friday morning. So uh, we had Tropical Storm Barry uh, in the Gulf of America or Mexico, however you want to, right. whatever you want to call it. Uh, made landfall in Mexico and the remnants of it uh, tracked northward and they merged into a retrograding, which is a backwards moving because it typically moves from west to east with the jet stream, but it was moving from east uh, to west. So that's, that's what called, that's what called retrograding. So we had a b- broad upper level area of low pressure that absorbed the remnants of uh, Tropical Storm Barry over central Texas, over the hill country, right. uh, where out where you live. And that produced um, what's called a mesoscale convective complex or mesoscale convective uh, vortex, more specifically, uh, because it had that rotation. And uh, that, you know, those dynamics in- were integrated together. And that uh, created this really heavy downpour of rain um, with some spin to it. And so that created the massive uh, enormous flooding across the region. And uh, as a result of the fact that the, the topography there uh, is very rocky, you have a very thin layer of topsoil, uh, right. a lot, it, it's not very absorbent. So any of the rain that falls is going to go down and trickle down into creeks and rivers and cause it to flood. Unfortunately, uh, for where the campers were, uh, the river crested 29.45 feet within, I think, 45 minutes, and it caught wow. people off guard. Uh, and that stuff happens very rapidly, and it comes with um, little... Uh, warning um for that specific you know location so that this thing this kind of thing could not have been prevented well, 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 right we'll get to that in a second i really appreciate you explaining it what, what did you call it it's something vortex again what, what was the oh, term mesos- you used? mesoscale mesoscale convective vortex so it's part how of, rare is that mes- uh, they're actually pretty common uh, they form okay. all the time it's where it's basically so a mesoscale convective uh, complex or a mesoscale convective system really is a, a group of thunderstorms that kind of organize together uh, and they track over the Great Plains all the time, Texas. Um, and, and if they get some spin to them, they're called a mesoscale convective vortex. And so those uh, systems, a lot of times if they go out over the Gulf, of, over, the Gulf uh, over open water, they can actually develop into a tropical storm uh, and, and become you know, a hurricane at some point. Right. So a lot of those, those processes uh, is kind of that's kind of what happened here. The problem is, is that a lot of computer models, especially those mesoscale ones, um, have a very difficult time. The processes which cause this, these systems to form are very poorly understood. Um, and so models cannot capture those. This is why we saw uh, on a lot of the modeling, you know, maybe three to six, maybe up to eight inches of rain in some spots, uh, you know, leading up to this event. Um, one model, the uh, the model that the TV meteorologists have on uh, in, on on stock called the graph model actually right. one of the runs there predicted 14 inches of rain for the area but then the very next run that came out six hours later showed uh like two inches of rain so it, 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 it could not have been predicted uh because of the poorly understood physics and stuff that go into these systems so um and when you're trying to predict a forecast or record-breaking event like this uh you really got to be careful because there's a fine line between okay i'm predicting something record-breaking i'm certain this is going to happen and then if you do that then that being a big false alarm, and then you lose trust right. with the public. It, it's it's a precarious situation to be in for sure. It's Chris Martz, uh, Martz M A R T Z. Go follow him over on X. Go in. Uh, it's at Chris Martz Weather W X. Chris Martz M A R T Z W X, or, or go to cfact.org. A lot there. I live in the area, as I said, been here twenty years. We've never seen anything like this. In fact, in four or five year in a four or five year period, I'd be stunned if we got six inches of rain the entire time. It, it almost never rained here for a long time. It's been a much more, I don't know, tropical uh, season this past year, six months to a year, for some reason. Who knows why? But uh, there's a creek system here because of the topography that, that you talked about. It's very, very hard rock. The creek system is supposed to divert and take these the, this water into different channels. But how much? do you know how much water it actually was they dumped within like an hour? Because you said it was 27 feet in like 45 minutes. But how much actual rainfall? Do we know the actual number? 
I don't know for the for that specific area how much. I think it was close for I think for Kerr County meteorologist Ryan Malley uh, did the calculations. You know, the back of the inflow number suggests about 120 billion gallons for just that county. 120 for, for billion County. gallons. I want to, for, let's for put that in perspective. Now, uh, ma- ma- many of these. Ma- ma- I'm sorry. I, I just have to stop you there. So many of the area, as I said, they have these dry creek beds that never have any water in them at all. They're all overflowing in full now anywhere you look. So 100, how many billion gallons? What was it? 120, 120 for Kirk County. That's unbelievable. So that, that's an event yeah. that we've never seen before then. Well, we have seen it in the in the general area, that whole river valley that you that you live in. We've seen rain like this before, um, but uh, for that individual location, uh, I don't think so. Uh, but the, we, but for the general area, because again, these events where this where there's a large amount of rain falls is in a very small you know column geographically speaking. But you can go back to July second, nineteen thirty two, when Mountain okay. Home, which isn't very far from uh, the San Antonio area, they recorded thirty two point four inches of rain in eighteen hours, which was caused by a very similar setup um and so that was more rain the highest rainfall total i think in the 24-hour period that i could find uh from this event and i haven't seen an official number yet is about 21 inches of rain um so the 1932 event was much had had much heavier rainfall in in general and in september 1921 um downtown san antonio was uh, flooded beneath up to 12 feet of flood water and um one of the uh, enthrall Texas recorded 32, 38.2 inches of rain in 24 hours. Uh, so it's not unprecedented, but it is certainly rare. And in the time you've been there, um, you said 20 years. So you've not yeah. seen anything like this. Um, yeah, I've been and, here and, since, and since kind of- exactly. We've been here since 2005. When we moved here, they said we had a major flooding event in 1998. And that was nothing like what we just saw here. So is it is the matter of the amount of water in the short amount of time? Because the Guadalupe River, as you said, it went up to 27 feet. I mean, there there was no building in that area, directly in that area, that was going to withstand that. We keep hearing the term wall of water. Is that literally what we were talking about? All of a sudden, boom, here it is, and here it's got to go. It's not so much like that. It's just that you get the, this heavy rainfall, and it fills up the river, and that just causes it to rise. Um, and so, then it, you know, of course, of course, you know, it flows downstream. So it, when you, you add that added effect to it, uh, it really piles up fast and it catches you off guard. And this was also at 5.30, you know, 5.30-ish in the morning, maybe a little bit before that, right. uh, when this really began to crank up. And so any of the warnings that went out from the weather service, a lot of people just were asleep and they weren't tuned into their phones. So there needs yeah. to be, in my opinion, a better county level flood warning system. I think we should have that everywhere, similar to the tornado siren effect. I couldn't agree more. It's Chris Martz, M-A-R-T-Z. Go follow him, Chris Martz, W-X, over on X, or uh, just go to cfact.org. So let's talk about the perfect storm, and pun is intended, I guess, um, of how this came together. You just made mention it really started happening at 5, 5.30 in the morning. The warnings went out at 1 o'clock, a little bit after 1 o'clock, then even more warnings were going on uh, into 2, 2.30. Everybody's asleep, as you said. Everybody's asleep. Nobody's listening. Nobody's wondering. And, and, and you said this a few times, and I wonder if you could expand upon this a little bit. This could not have been predicted. A couple of things. When it's a 1 o'clock in the morning thing, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? Maybe a siren system? Like, when I was in mid-Michigan, there were tornadoes there, so there's, there's a tornado siren that will go off to let people know it's actually happening. Uh, is that what you mean, like an early warning system? Because phones are great, but if you're camping out somewhere, you might have a dead phone, then you're not going to get an early warning at 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning. What system do you think should be put in place? Well, I think uh, one of the te- I think is it was it, was it in where Hunt is? That's in Kerr County, right? I think it's in right. Kerr County is where Hunt is. I think uh, some of the counties there they six or seven years ago after I think Hurricane Harvey that was twenty seventeen. So yeah, about seven eight years ago they wanted to implement a, a county level flood warning system with sirens, and a, a lot of the locals from my from my understanding um, opposed it because of how expensive it was. And then um, so something like that would be good, but I think there should be some sort of national effort. Uh, to implement those, especially in, 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 along the floodplains where we have uh, places that flood easily. And you can go back again, back to the 1940s, 1930s, uh, over the last 200 years, really. And there, are, there have been these kinds of floods um, in, in that general area, maybe not necessarily where Camp Mystic is or near Hunt, but definitely it's just in the general area. Uh, there's a, Because of the topography and, and the way the land is, it's susceptible to flooding. And so something like that would definitely be 
uh, useful to save lives and property. I mean, maybe not property, but definitely save lives. Yeah. Uh, they had those early warning systems. And, um, you know, the, the weather service that yet the uh, day before out on Thursday um, in the early afternoon, they posted a, a flood watch for the area. Now, flood watch just means that you should be weather aware. And maybe the people who are you know, headed Camp Mystic, they may, may have seen that, maybe not. Right. Um, and then when the when when stuff was, when, when the ingredients were there when this was literally going to happen they issued a flood warning to warn people three hours in advance uh, but again that was at one o'clock in the morning you know central time so people were not going to be able to people were not able to they were again probably asleep um, so this is something that we need to you know be more this is a lesson learned that we need to be more proactive and figuring out ways to you know try and prevent something like this from happening yeah. again and another problem that is I don't think. I think I should underscore here, and it's not emphasized enough, is that um, while that's not necessarily the case at the Austin San Antonio office, there is a lot of weather fatigue. Uh, people have a lot of these, some of these, some, some National Weather Service offices like Sterling, which is Virginia, which is the, my nearest one, and also Mount Holly, uh, New Jersey, which is for the Philadelphia area in Pennsylvania right. and uh, New Jersey. They have, um, they have sometimes issued flood warnings, you know, repeatedly that have uh, been false alarms. And so if you keep doing that, you keep crying wolf, people are not going to take you as seriously. So yeah. this goes back to my point originally, where where if you're forecasting something that's record breaking, like a record breaking, breaking flood or something, you know, you got to be sure that that's going to happen. Because if you don't, if, if it doesn't happen, you're going to lose credibility. So it's a, being a meteorologist that's in the for operational forecasting um, sector, it's a very tough job and it's, it's uh, very stressful. It is meteorologist uh, Chris Martz. Uh, go to Chris Martz, uh, uh, WX, C-H-R-I-S is the first name, last name M-A-R-T-Z, then WX for weather, or go to cfact.org. You mentioned Hurricane Harvey, which just sat over Houston and just decimated the place with water. Um, does Did this thing do the same thing as that? Did it sit over Kirk County for a while? And by the way, Hunt is in West, uh, western Kirk County, so you were right about that. Did it just sit there, or, or is this just what these these vortexes do that you were talking about? Well, yeah, Hurricane Harvey uh, stalled, and so uh, did this uh, mesoscale convective vortex, um, the, these, this complex of thunderstorms that had some rotation to them. Uh, they also stalled, and, and this is kind of the nature of a lot of these, a lot of these uh, systems, uh, because they are detached from the main jet stream flow, which carries stuff along, all those trade right. winds, they carry stuff along and, and kick it out of there. And if you don't have that, you're just kind of sitting in a warm, humid, tropical air mass with this, you know, convection going on, it just has there's nothing that's able to steer it out of there. So it just sits and, and spins a, until it, it wears itself out and runs out of energy. And that's exactly what we saw in 2017 with Hurricane Harvey. Once it lost its tropical characteristics, and this is the same thing we saw here with the remnants of Tropical Storm Barry. Now, when when we talk about predicting, uh, it is a very precarious thing. I've been in television news and, and radio for 36 years, and meteorology is an imperfect science. You guys do the best that you possibly can, and I appreciate that. But oftentimes, you're not right, and it's not your <laughs> fault. You just can't. I mean, it's it's an act of God. I mean, you really you can predict it. That's why the spaghetti models on hurricanes are always could be here, it could be way down here. So, I mean, I get that. It's a very, very hard thing to pinpoint. What can be done better on a meteorological sort of standing um, to pinpoint it better? Is that just the way it is? Nature's going to do what nature does, and we got as close as we could? Well, we have gotten immensely better at being able to predict stuff. I mean, back back in the you know, the a good example of this is the uh, hurricane, the Category 4 hurricane, the Galveston hurricane of 1900. Right. A meteorologist that day predicted sunny weather, sunny skies, and it was that for a while until the hurricane right. came. And it barreled down Galveston, and and it killed eight to twelve thousand people. That's still the largest death toll from a hurricane. Yeah, and obviously back then we we didn't have satellites, so we couldn't see that. Oh, there's a storm out over the Gulf. It's going to make landfall in, in in six days, you know, or or we didn't have you know the numerical forecast models from the weather balloon data, all that. Uh, so we've gotten immensely better at doing it, but I don't think it's ever going to be able to be, you know, perfected to the point uh, where we can, we're, we're certain that this is gonna happen, especially with systems like this. I mean, the, rem, the, the remnants, it's one thing to predict where a hurricane's gonna track. That's pretty easy to do, you know, within even down to 50 miles, you can do pretty well with that um, today, even out seven days or so. But 
the one problem is is that when you have like these thunderstorm complexes that form they, they form due to spots uh due to spots of positive buoyancy in the atmosphere where the air is a little bit warmer because warm air rises like your attic is really warm so you get the sun shining down it heats the ground up and some surfaces heat faster than others like asphalt's right. going to heat hotter heat faster than um, and air over it than air over grass. So right. you get that positive buoyancy, the air is going to rise. And where that exactly happens and where it doesn't is very difficult to pinpoint on models. And I don't think we're ever going to really be able to nail that down with perfection. Um, we can get better, but it's going to get um, incredibly, the progress is going to be incredibly smaller as uh, time goes on because there's only going to be so much computing power and, 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 and physical processes that we can understand. I grew up in South Florida, Chris, so we had hurricanes all the time. I remember playing football in the middle of Hurricane David in 1978 or something. Um, <laughs> oh. it, 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 it was the eye of the storm, and it was just very, very calm. And then Hurricane David wasn't as big and bad as it could have been. I've covered George. I've covered Charlie. I've covered everything that went through the middle of Florida. Um, because Florida, by, by and large, is below sea level, and it's flat, um, you can, I would guess, better predict what's going to happen when it gets over that small piece of land. Is it a really different challenge for a meteorologist to predict something over a gigantic landmass like Texas? And what I mean is, yeah, Houston gets hurricanes because it's right on the water. We're here in the San Antonio area and then the hill country, certainly, it's all landlocked. So is it a harder job to predict something meteorologically because of the topography here and because you don't really know what's going to happen? Like, again, Florida, flat. I was on the air during Hurricane Andrew. When that came through, we knew it ended up going south of where we thought, but only by 50 or 60 miles. Is it harder to predict it here because of the way Texas is built? It's harder to predict uh, because of the mesoscale nature of it. Um, and hurricanes are, can also be mesoscale features. There's, they usually are, but there's there's different types of levels of mesoscale, like mesoscale, alpha, and beta, different, different – it has to do with the – uh, resolution and how how many right. miles and, or kilometers it is. Um, so we're talking about these kinds of, and again, these are like, you know, there's thunderstorms and stuff. Uh, when you have also the, you know, the orographic enhancement of it, um, which can happen over parts of Texas where it's a little bit rockier, a little bit more mountainous. Um, and the same thing would happen in Helene back in the Carolinas last year in, in Northeast Georgia. Um, that orographic enhancement or just a little bit of lifting air over a little bit of slope terrain and stuff, including right. over Texas, the models really do not capture that well at all. Um, and we're going to have to have, I think, higher resolution modeling um, to be able to do that better. But it's going to require that requires a lot of money, uh, yeah. taxpayer money, because a lot of this, you know, a lot of these models that are not that are the U.S. models are taxpayer funded, like the GFS, which is, you know, a more global scale model. But then you have like high resolution, rapid refresh, HRRR, and the North American um, mesoscale model, the NAM. So it's uh, th those models are going to have to factor in those topography changes because that's a that's a significant player. And how much if you, if you can if you lift air over a mountain, it's going to cool and condense the same way as it just rises and condenses, right. uh, cools and condenses. So um, yeah, so to your point, it's it it can be much harder over over land to predict this kind of thing. It's uh, Chris Martz. Go follow him. Chris, M-A-R-T-Z-W-X over on X. CFAC.org is the website. Chris, fascinating stuff. I appreciate you just coming on, giving us the science and letting us know what was going on. Let's, let's get together again. I really appreciate the time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. All right. We appreciate you. We're back after this. Stay right here.